We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to look at a chunk of land between verses 16 and 40. 1 Kings 18, right about now you're saying, where is 1 Kings, man? Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You get into Joshua, Je right? And then you get into 1 and 2 Samuel. And then after Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel is 1 and 2 Kings, right? You move into that pretty close. So we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18, a very famous story in regards to what God did to demarcate himself as the real God. And the, and the title of the sermon is, Will the Real God Stand Up? And uh, this is what it's basically going to say. I'm going I'm to read a small chunk of land here, just a very small piece of it. Okay, verse 30, let's look at there first. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. Verse 32, with the stones... He built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering on the wood. Then he said in verse 34, Do it again, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. In verse 36, and this is where it gets into the key of it, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord God, are the God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray this morning, Lord, that you um, send your spirit to instruct our hearts, illuminate our minds, Father, in the text, help the text to teach us, to guide us, to, to lead us into greater sanctification with you, Father. May we be encouraged to choose you above all other things, God, today, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was thinking about a I'm old school a little bit, right? I mean, today it's LeBron James is the big king in the NBA, and, and he's a stud in his old, right? But when I was coming up through the ranks, uh, there was this little-known peon named Michael Jordan and uh, with the Chicago Bulls, and nobody really knew who he was, just led the league in, like, every category and, you know, six, seven national champions or world championships with them and stuff. And, but he wrote a series of books, and in one of those books, it's very interesting, the Drive from Within is one of his books. I think it came out in 2005, well after he retired. And, and, he, and he talks about an interesting story in there that kind of illustrates our passage a little bit to kind of get our minds moving in that direction. He talks about going over to Fred Whitfield, who's the CEO of, a, of another NBA team and a good close friend of Michael Jordan. And he goes over to his house, and, and they're going out to dinner in Chicago in the middle of the wintertime, and Michael Jordan had a light jacket on him. Realized it was much colder than he thought, and he says to his buddy, he says, hey, can I borrow a jacket? And Fred says, sure, go down to the cook closet down there and pick one out. Michael goes down for a while, and he just kind of disappears for a bit. Fred wonders what's going on, and pretty soon Michael comes back with his heap of clothing in his hands that he marches in front of Fred and dumps it on the floor. And he says, what is this stuff? Well, if you know anything about Michael Jordan, he was the endorser of Nike, right? He, he was the king of just do it. And half of the closet was Nike, Fred, but the other half was Puma gear, which was from another NBA star, Ralph Sampson, if you know him, that had retired. And so Michael says, what is this stuff? And he says, well, you know, Michael, some of it's yours and some of it's his. I'm close friends with both of you. Next thing you know, he turns around and Michael Jordan is gone again, this time to the kitchen. And he comes back waving this huge butcher knife. And he jumps into this pile and, according to their account, cuts these puma gear into about a few hundred pieces, picks them up, walks out into the snow, and puts it in the dumpster. He comes back to his best friend, Fred, and says, Call my agent tomorrow. Here's the number. He will give you anything you want, as much of it as you want to wear. But don't let me ever 
ever see you wear anything other than Nike, you cannot ride the fence. That's exactly what we're talking about today. Because in the, the passage before us, what we see is all of Israel's trying to ride the fence. They're just like you and I. I mean, they, they want a little bit of this, the Baals. And then you, you hear about Baal, the god Baal, but it's actually Baals, plural. There's multiple gods. It was the sun god that gave them heat and fire. It was the rain and dew god, the, 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 the Thor of the ancient Near East that had the storm god that sent rain and all that. And if you know the background of 1 Kings 18, and me and somebody earlier were talking about this, the background is the god man Elijah, right? He hears from the Lord as his prophet. And God's going to judge King Ahab and his queen Jezebel that are pushing all of Israel to worship Baal because Jezebel's from Sidon. She's a Phoenician, the enemy of God's people. And when she marries King Ahab, she influences her husband, and she wants all of Israel to give up Yahweh and his worship and instead to turn to the Baals. And so she becomes vicious going after God's prophets, killing them, bloodletting in the streets. And in the midst of this, God calls out his prophet Elijah and says, as a judgment on the land, pray. And Elijah prays, and God closes up the skies, and there isn't an ounce of water for three and a half years. So they cry out to their rain god, their storm god Baal, and nothing comes. In the midst of that, where the people are, are riding the fence, worshiping Yahweh, but also worshiping the Baals, in the midst of that comes Elijah on the scene. And instead of reading this big chapter, I'll just give you the background. He, he comes up on the scene, and he, and he kind of tells the people, this is how it's going to be. But before he does that, he goes to King Ahab. He says to Obadiah, one of the right-hand guys, who is a believer of Ahab, he says, go summon the king, and the king comes. Ahab, by the way, is scared out of his mind to do that. He thinks the king's going to kill him because he's been looking to kill Elijah. So when he goes and tells the king, King Ahab comes, and Elijah calls out the king and says get all the prophets of Baal get all the prophets of Asherah another god and meet me on Mount Carmel and we're going to see who the true God is this day we're going to find out who is God in all of Israel and that's kind of where we pick up the story the first thing I want you to see in verses 16 through 20 is that we have to be bold in dealing with the world system bold in dealing with the world system, right? So Obadiah went to meet with Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet with Elijah. Verse 17, he saw Elijah and said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Remember? He had prayed, and God had closed up the skies, and there had been no water. And so people are in a famine and in a drought, and so he's calling him the troublemaker. If you had just followed the Baals like everybody else, then all Israel would come. Why are you such a troublemaker, right? Verse 16, verse 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 400, now pay attention to the numbers, bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the other 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So the first thing that we see in this principle as we go into 2019 is that we need to understand the world system, and we need to deal with the world system. One of the things that's hard to watch as a minister, as a professional counselor, as those kinds of things, is what I call hide your head in the sand theology. Do you know what that is? That means I deny my problem in a clinical term. I deny my problem, and I avoid dealing with it in hopes that it will just take care of itself. How many of you have seen that work, that it just takes care of itself most of the time? Ah, yeah, that's what I thought. It's pretty rare, right? Hide, hide your head in the sand doesn't work. You have to deal with things head on. Now, now, Elijah knew the world that he was in. In fact, he prays earlier. He says to God, I'm the only prophet of yours left. Now, there was others. Obadiah was hiding groups of 50 in the caves and feeding them from the king's table while the king was looking to kill them, and Jezebel's queen was too. And Obadiah was taking care of him, but, but Elijah's one of the few, one of the few and far between. And he knows the world that he deals in, that, that from the top down, 
through all the media, through all the military, through everything politically, socially, it's against God, and he is standing in the gap, to use an Ezekiel term. He knows the sewage that he's in. But does, when we read Elijah's response, when he talks to Ahab, does it sound like a guy who's not courageous? Does it sound like a guy doesn't believe that God's going to come through? Does it sound like that, or does he sound like a guy that believes God's going to come through? He believes that God's going to come through. He knows his God, and he knows his God and his worldview, and he knows the world under Ahab and his worldview, and he chooses God, and he's walked with God, and he knows God, and so he's confident to call out Ahab and Jezebel and all their evil prophets up on the mountain of Carmel. He believes that the biblical system that he's known, the Yahweh God, will be greater than the world system that they know. Now think about it. Does that reflect believers today? When you look at other believers and Christians, does that reflect us today? So I was doing the research this week. You know I do lots of that. Some of it in person, some of it online, but the research was this, that that the divorce rates of born-again believing Christians in the late 90s exceeded the divorce rate of the regular non-believing population. Should that ever be among God's people? Now, we all know that there's reasons that are legitimate and biblical to get divorced. We're not talking about that. We're not beating that drum. We're just saying that God's people shouldn't have the same divorce rate as the world around them. Now, it's better now. It's improved. That's a good thing. So I was looking at a few other measures, right? Cohabitation. God's people living together, not being married. The rate of Christians cohabiting together is only 20% less than the world's rate of cohabitation, which is the norm now. Instead of young people getting married, they are living together. There's a host of excuses and reasons, and some of them sound legitimate and all those things, but But at the end of the day, we have to choose whether we're going to obey God or not. The church, when you think of our sexuality, one in two men in the pew in the church are struggling with pornography addiction. So I said, okay, what about guys like me, ministers? 25% of ministers, one in four, are actively fighting a pornography addiction. Can you believe that? Why should we look the same as the world? God calls us out and says that you are in Christ. You're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And he gives us the power to do something about that. He saves us from the penalty of sin at salvation. But then in our sanctification for the rest of our life, he can work to save us from the power of sin. Amen? He gives us the Holy Spirit to do that. He gives us tools like his word and prayer and the church to help us for that. But most of the time when you counsel believers, we say about ourselves, I just can't get over that. That is not true. Our God, as we're going to see in this passage, is the God who releases us from bondage. He releases us from sin. And He can set us on the path. And so that first thing that I think we need to look at is we need to know the world system that we're in and we need to boldly challenge it, okay? The second thing is what we saw at the beginning with Michael Jordan. We cannot ride the fence, right? Verse 20, so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled all these 850 prophets on Mount Carmel, right? Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? This is a key verse. You want to circle this in your Bible. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. The literal translation of this you see more in the ESV, the English Standard Version, which says, how long shall you go on limping? between two opinions. The Hebrew word there that we translate waver is this idea of a man that is lame, that is crippled, and as he tries to surf through a room, he bounces into different items to support him. And this idea that you go from piece of furniture to piece of furniture to support you if you don't have a crutch, this idea of of limping along. And so Elijah calls out Israel and says, how long will you limp between two opinions? How long should you have one foot in the world and one foot in God's kingdom? How long shall you choose 
everything at the buffet and put it on your plate. That's the key idea here. Now, if you invited Elijah to Sunday dinner, it's going to be a good time. Elijah's going to sit there, say thank you for the peas and the corn, and this is a wonderful ham, and this has been a delightful meal. No, 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 no. This is God's prophet, and he's going to call it as it is, and if the peas aren't right, he's going to tell you they're a little hard, okay? And the corn was a little mushy, and the ham, I've had better. I mean, Elijah is not a bad man, but Elijah calls it straight down the middle. And he says, this is how it is, straight up. How long are you going to waver between, go on limping between two opinions? He's a man of faith, and he boldly stands on Carmel in front of all the people, and he basically tells them to man up, right? And as we go on to look at it, he's going to prove that Jesus Christ, Yahweh in the Old Testament, is the God of all Israel and the God of all the earth. He's going to categorically show that. But he's asking the people, why? Why are you playing around? Why are you messing with this, that, and the other? Now this this fits. This passage that's over a thousand years old fits with us today. Because we're these kind of people. Our culture today believes in in everything and anything. You You can gather philosophies from all ends of the earth And as long as it works for you, I've actually had professors tell me this, as long as it works for you, then it's just fine. Elijah, if he was standing in the room, would say, that's bunk. Hit the door. It is not just fine. There is only one way, and it's God's way, right? But in our world today, we we pull from nihilism. We pull from transcendental meditation. We pull from existentialism and secular humanism and atheism and I'll take a little bit of evolution and I'll mix that in with positive scientificism and and all these different things from the enlightenment and the postmodern I'll put all these things together and we wonder why our young people are so confused they're swimming in a sea of nonsense of poisons mixed together that you're bound to get infected from right whether it's in the schools or whether it's in the colleges or in the military, it doesn't matter anymore. In our homes, we are allowing every form of sewage to affect the Christian family all the time. Now, this is the interesting part. Okay, we need to know those things. I'm a big believer in that. I went to secular schools all the way until I went to the seminary. Got multiple secular degrees. I believe in interacting with the world and being part of the world, but not of the world, if that makes any sense. But this is the thing. When the average Christian family watches 700% more TV, just TV, not tablets, not phones, just TV, 700% more time on TV than they do having anything to do with reading their Bibles, going to worship, small group, or anything having to do with their faith, you're at an obvious disadvantage right off. You throw in tablets, you throw in cell phones that are smartphones, you throw in our books and our education everything else it it, we're a glimmer is all we're giving our kids and each other but we're sucking in tons of the world's favors and acting like it's going to be just fine it's not you know when i when i was in high school i used to go to cu boulder and you know i'm a graduate of there of colorado university's system out of uccs and and when i would go to boulder i would go because their football team was phenomenal and being an all-state player, I want to go and learn from the great guys at CU. And you go watch the the B enemies, the Eric B enemies, and you go watch, you know, all you know, Christian Fourier, the tight end, all the, all these great players. And I remember one time we were there for a week of camp, my senior year, before my senior year. We went into the weight room to work out, and I was working out with these two guys. Okay, one was wearing a bright red T-shirt, one was wearing a bright orange kind of maroonish t-shirt I'll let you guess what those colleges were and in the middle of doing squats I hear this scream stop well we froze in the back of the gym was a group of five CU players they come running at us I'm thinking I'm gonna die okay they snatch these two guys up like grab them by the shoulders what are you doing I'm thinking are we doing this wrong? We're doing the sets we're being told to do. Are we doing our form right? 
shut up, it has nothing to do with that. Peel those t-shirts off. One guy was wearing Oklahoma University. One was wearing Nebraska. They were part of the Big 8 at that time, and Colorado was the two-time Big 8 champion at the time. And they said, you will not wear that garbage in our house. Now, in reprise, they gave them seven free CU football shirts, one for every day of the week. Their size. Gentlemen, take these home. And then to show what good guys they were, they worked out with us, which was a real treat. But you get the point, right? Not in our house. We're not going to have the enemy, and Nebraska's a good school, and so is Oklahoma. They're great programs. But you get it, the rivalry in football. You're not going to have the opponent in your house. And yet, day in and day out, how often do we invite the opponent through different forms of media and different things into our house? And slowly but surely start to adopt those viewpoints. Think about what the scripture says. We just look at the book of James. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, chapter 1. Because he who doubts is like a wave on the sea blown and tossed. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. The scripture tells us we cannot be double-minded. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either hate one or you'll serve the other. You cannot serve both God and money, the context he was using. You must have a master, and it can't be two. Joshua 24, 15 puts it this way. They had just conquered the land, and and Joshua says to the people, you may follow the gods of the Amorites, and you may follow the gods of the Amalekites or whatever else, and you got to choose, though. And he says in Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. And then the next part of that verse, we post in our houses, right? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? I mean, folks, Jesus will take us any way that we are, but he'll never leave us there. Amen? He's not okay with us having two feet in the world and just a toe with him he wants all of us because he knows the outcome is going to be great and so in 2019 as your pastor i want to challenge you that that we need to choose who we're going to follow and go all in if you've ever played texas hold'em you can't ride the fence at some point you got to put all your chips in and say this is it this is my best hand and i'm going for broke And at some point, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to say we're putting all the chips in for Jesus Christ. Or not. But we don't get to ride the fence. We don't get to ride the fence. Third, I want you to see that the nature of idols, these false gods that we worship, is so disturbing, right? Verse 22, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets, and there was another 400 of Asherah. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, and, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you can call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is the God. Then all the people said, what you say is good, right? This is the people's way of saying, you go, brother. Absolutely, we're in this game. But... He gave all the advantage to his opponents. Elijah was not afraid of his God and his God showing up. He gave all the advantage to the Baal opponents. There's one of me. There's 450 of you plus the other 400. Bring your 850. Let's go. One versus 850. And I'm going to let you go first. And what you don't know about the background is Mount Carmel was a common place for them to worship the Asherah gods in the high places, and to offer up fire offerings to Baal. So this is their backyard. We're playing on your home field advantage. We're giving you all the advantage. You choose the heifer. You get the best one. So you can't say that I got the worst one, or I got the best one, you got the worst one. You choose. You go first. And it's basically like in, in football, sudden death. If they were able to call down fire from Baal and burn up the offering, it would be over and Elijah would be killed. His name and the name of God, his life is on the line. All the advantages to Baal. But Elijah's not afraid. 
He gives it to him. Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. There may, there, uh, since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, gave it to them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. Verse 27, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and should be awakened. In the Hebrew, there's a little bit of fun in here. There's a euphemism. When it says that he is busy, it means literally he's relieving himself. Now, this is not an endorsement for us to go out and beat up on other people, right, that don't believe. That's not what this is. We've got to be careful of this. But in this context where they're killing God's people, Elijah calls them out, and he says, where's your God? He's busy thinking. He's using the restroom. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's not that much of a God after all. Verse 28, so they, the Baal prophets, they shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Literally, in the translation it is, till their blood gushed out. This is a mosh pit of untold proportions. They believed as part of their rituals that if you, if you bled your victims, that your God would show up. And so they're bleeding themselves. They're cutting themselves. Midday passed, verse 29, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. And here's the big part, but there was no response. No one answered no one paid attention. That's mentioned twice in that text. It's the biblical way of saying to you, there is no Baal. There is no false God. He's not going to show up because he does not exist. And when we follow our false gods, there's a price to be paid. That's the hard part for me is, look what it cost them. They exhausted themselves. They blew out the day. They wore themselves out in their resources, and they cut and self-mutilated themselves. When we follow false gods, there's a cost to be paid. When the, when the lie is that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere about your belief, and as long as you're sincere, it'll be just fine. In my experience as a social worker, as a therapist, or a pastor, that, that's not true. When I went with my fellow social worker, to Memorial Hospital in Carl Springs, and we looked at a 14-year-old that was in a four-point restraints in the ER as she was coming down off of her first hit of heroin. And she was having such a bad reaction that even with Ativan, a chemical restraints and four-point restraints and other good medicines in her body, she was literally trying to peel her flesh off of her skeleton. What we give our lives to matters, people. It matters. It doesn't matter that you just believe in whatever and you're sincere. She was sincere that heroin was going to take care of her, and it did not. It almost cost her her life that night as she detoxed, and they were barely able to keep her alive after her first run with it. And then the police got a hold of her, and she had to deal with that. I say these things because we believe that success We can have success and then a little bit of Jesus and it'll be fine. But we often end up spiritually empty. We believe we can have comfort as a God and and a little bit of Jesus and we'll be fine. And we end up spiritually at unrest. Do you know how many people have everything that they want and more and will confess to me in session that, Greg, I just feel empty inside. Jesus has to be first. There is no playing around with it, folks. We cannot act like it's a game. There's too much on the line. We see it in the newspapers every single day that what we make as a God comes up short, right? Adam and Eve made themselves God, and they lost paradise. And when we do that, we lose the same thing. Ultimately, what we believe in, it's not about sincerity. It's not about whatever. It's about... It matters, and it matters a ton. The journey that we're on with the God that we're with matters. Psalms 135 says something about this, verse 15. 
The idols of the nations are gold and silver made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouth. Those who make them will be like them, and so are all those who trust in them. That last statement holds to us, right? When we make our bank account and our finances our God, it becomes like us, and we become like it. Money becomes first in our life. It's not a matter of taking care of yourself and giving and saving. Those are all biblical principles. But you know those people that are chasing the coin, that are chasing the greenback. It will not deliver for them. How about the guy at the gym, right? Chasing their body. I was doing some research on how our culture has, has deified the human body. How much money is spent, whether it's cosmetics or shaving stuff or, or the latest steroid or, or this food or that supplement to build this machine, which is a good thing. I mean, Paul says in 1 Timothy, physical training is of some value. The training in godliness has the value for both this life and the life to come for eternity. But we, we deify the body. And when I'm having lunch with another couple and the woman says, Oh, don't put that in your mouth. You'll throw away an entire week's worth of pro progress. And the husband kind of jerks back from the piece of lasagna as if it's a snake that's going to bite him. Now, don't get me wrong. They're working very hard. They're in very good shape. They're very lean. But, but maybe we've lost some balance, amen? Maybe we've lost, now I need a little bit more balance, but maybe they've lost a little bit of balance. What we believe in matters. It's not about sincerity. It's about the object of the faith that we follow. It's not just about the faith. It's about the object of the faith that we follow, okay? In verses 30 to 38, the provision of the real God in dealing with this is powerful and gracious, right? Elijah rebuilds the altar. I read that to you. The 12 stones representing each of the tribes of Jacob. And then he, he builds it up and and he has this moat, this ditch around it, and he tells them, load up the jars and pour it on there. And when they do it, he says, do it again. And when they do it, he says, do it a third time. And, and you've got to ask yourself, if you're a careful reader of the text, why is, he, why is he doing this? They're not asking him for water on the, on the mound. Why is he doing this? Well, if you know a lot about the ancient Near East culture, the Baal prophets were like modern-day prophets, charlatans, right? They would build these sacrifices, and they would hide an accelerant down below where nobody could see it. And when they would draw the people to worship Baal, and they couldn't get him to light it on fire, they would have one of their guys just sneakily light that accelerant, which would catch it all on fire, and then they would claim that Baal did it. Elijah wanted his opponents who did that to know that there was no way that he did that, that they had soaked it all to the bone and filled up the trough with water, right? And then the man of God steps forward in verse 36 at the time of the sacrifice, and you can envision this in your head. He steps forward and he prays. He calls out to God, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel and that I'm your servant and done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, that these people may know you, Lord our God. Elijah wasn't in it for himself. He was looking after the glory of the Almighty. God, answer me, not for my good or for my benefit or my name, but answer me so that the people here will know that you are the real God, the only God, the only one, and that their hearts may turn back to you. He was looking after the glory of God, and he calls out to God, and he says, please answer me. So he, he, he prepares it, and then he calls out in this petition. And then what happens? God shows up huge. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord did what? It fell down from heaven. It burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the wood. It burned up the stones. And it burned up the soil. And it burned up all the water in the trench. Now, John, you're a welder back there. You ever seen fire that hot? that it burns up the stone and the earth and everything with it? 
I mean, we were close to, when we lived in Carl Springs to the Hayman Fire back in 2003. And the Hayman Fire got so big and so hot and so huge that it burned the top two inches of topsoil to where nothing would grow. I had never seen anything like it in my life. It was crazy to look at, right? And so they had to bring in topsoil, and they had to plant plants deeper, so they grow and all that stuff. Well, man, can you imagine? There's not been an ounce of rain in the land, and fire falls from heaven and consumes everything. And the book of Hebrews tells us, our God is a consuming fire, both good and bad. When His Spirit baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, it's good. When you go against Him, it can be bad. But our God is not something to trifle with. He's not a joke. When He shows up, He shows up huge, and He did a miracle. Now, this is important for us to think about. Well, Greg, God did a miracle then. I believe it. Does He do miracles today? Yes, He does. We've all seen those. We've experienced those. But guess what? We can't schedule those. Understand? We don't get to call them up. We don't get to put them on the calendar at this time. God's not going to be put in a box. He's God. So that it's not going to work that way for us. But think about this. This is a true story. I was looking this up. Allegheny College in the early 1900s had a chemistry class. It was the most popular. It had tons of kids. The freshmen would go through it. And Dr. Lee, every year before Thanksgiving, would lecture on the in value the not usefulness of prayer. And he had a glass flask that he used to hold bourbon in. And he'd say, I will hold up this flask, and any of you who believe in prayer, I will drop it to the floor, and if your God is real, it will not shatter when it hits the tile. Well, a few people had tried it out, and of course it had shattered, and, and he kept up his challenge every single year before Thanksgiving, before the Christmas season. One year, a new freshman spent time with God after the challenge, and he felt like God was leading him to say something. But he was worried. So he, he went to the professor and he said, I will accept your challenge. The professor said, well, let's lay out the whole thing. I will hold it up at arm's length and I will drop it. But you can do whatever you need. You can call in whoever you want. You want your parents to come pray with you? Bring them. You want your grandparents to come pray with you? Bring them. You want your friends to pray with you? Bring them. So the boy took him up on his answer. He brought in his parents and his grandparents and his aunts and his uncles and his cousins and his buddies from the college, and they filled the stage. And the professor said, let's not be irreverent. Let's be quiet. Let's be honorable towards their false god, and let's let them pray. And so they did. The professor held out his hand with the gold in the, gold in the glass flask. It's not gold, it's glass. And he dropped it, and when he dropped it, it fell in an arc out of his hand, hit his big toe, rolled over, and laid flat on the tile in one piece. From that day forward, Dr. Lee never challenged anybody again against prayer. Does God do miracles? Yes, he does. But you and I don't get to call them down whenever we want, and we don't get to schedule them. God chooses when he shows up, amen? But he does. He does all the time. I mean, in my house, my daughter and I, when I was picking her up yesterday, Sarah was asking me, Dad, what did you like most about Christmas? I was asking her, she's asking me, and I said, I am thankful to Jesus Christ for healing my son from the illness that he's had. Because the doctor said, I don't know how this is going to go. He may have this for life. This could kill him. That's an eye-opener when the infectious disease doctor tells you that. And now he says, hey, if he has no signs... More than likely, you got to love doctors, more than likely he's out of the woods. Boy, I'd like to have 100% doc, but that's okay. We'll walk with Jesus, right? God's been good. I don't know what the end game is, but we're walking with Jesus, and God's been good, and he's done a miracle in Greg's life. And we worship him for that. We love him for that. God's grace was on display. Did he wipe out his people that had one foot in the world and one foot in him? No. But did he deal harshly? with those who promoted evil. Verse 40, Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't any of them get away. Seize them. They brought them down the Kishon Valley and they slaughtered them there. Sometimes we struggle with these things and we say, Whoa, what a God. What? We do the same thing. We invade Iraq. 
because of its slaughtering of Kurds. We invade Iraq because it invaded Kuwait and it harmed innocent millions. We invade Iraq because it had gassed 8 million Iranians with nerve gas in the Iran-Iraq war. And when we run into the leaders that were the promulgators of this great evil, Saddam Hussein and his sons, that held their rape rallies and their evil things, we dealt with them accordingly because it was just. We saw them eliminated from the end of the earth. Now that may sound tough, but some forms of evil are so great that you cannot allow them to stick around. So this is a great story of what God's done, right? Verse 39, all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Their hearts returned back to him. And so what are the takeaways as we close this? First of all, all religions and beliefs are not the same. You should write that down. All religions and beliefs are not the same. They're often mutually exclusive. And when you worship one opposing God, you cannot worship the other. We must choose, and we must not ride the fence. Second thing, activity and enthusiasm are not always signs of spirituality. I hear it over and over and over, if you're just sincere, if you, if you just really believe and pour yourself into it. Well, I think the Baal prophets believed and poured themselves into it, don't you think? Even their own blood. Energy, enthusiasm, activity are not always signs of genuine spirituality. Some of the strongest Christians I've known were quiet about their faith, but they were faithful through the hardest things in their lives. They stuck to Jesus. They shared Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They were with Jesus in the Word every single day. They talked to Jesus throughout the day, and you would never know it because they were the quietest people in church and out on the street. But they are often the most powerful people Third, the act of faith is not the most important thing. The object of the faith is, right? The person that you trust in. The act of faith is not the most important thing. What you have faith in, who you have faith in, Jesus is trustworthy. Peter walked on water literally, okay, because of Jesus Christ. Paul saw the gates of a jail, Roman jail, opened up literally and set free because of Jesus Christ. He was stoned to the point of death after being beaten and left for dead, and God lifted him up, and he walked off, and he continued as a missionary. He was bit by the poisonous snake on the island among the wood pile, and he walked away just fine. Who you have faith in matters. The object or person of your faith matters, not just your faith. The Baal prophets had faith, but it wasn't in anything real. There was no response. There was no God there. But Jesus is real, right? He was the God who was a Daniel in the lion's den. He was the God with Noah when the floods came. He was the God of Abraham that gave him a child when he was old. He is the God that is trustworthy, and he's the God that has died in your place and mine to give us eternal life, amen? He is trustworthy as we go into 2019. Jesus is worthy of your trust. He loves you. He's gracious to you, and we've looked at that. Fourth, the faith you live by better be good enough to die by. The faith you live by better be good enough to die by. As we go into 2019, I want you to finish your thought with this image along what happened up on Mount Carmel. If you know the movie, the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade of 1989, at the end of it, when he's searching the Holy Grail, there's three tests. And the evil Nazi guy shoots his father, and his father's bleeding and dying. And he has to pass the test to get the Holy Grail to heal his father. And they call out to Indiana, who's inside, and they say, Indiana, hurry. He had passed the first two tests. He had kneeled before God, and whew, the thing went over his head. And he'd walked the steps of God and got through the room. But now he's standing at the lion's head, and he's looking down this great chasm. And they say, Indy, hurry. Your dad only has a little bit of time. And the atheistic archaeologist has to ask himself, and his dad even says in a scene, boy, what do you really believe? And the test is only the man who leaps from the lion's head, which he was standing underneath, shall prove its worth. And in a great scene of, of Indiana Jones, of Harrison Ford's good acting, he kind of puts his hand to his chest, kind of closes his eyes, he kind of woggles a little bit and breathes and steps out. 
And sure enough, there's an invisible bridge there, right? As we're going to 2019, you need to make sure that the faith you live by is good enough to die by. We went into 2018 with certain people among us that are not with us today. We will go into 2020, maybe, with some of us that are among us, not with us then. You need to make sure that the faith that you live by and the object of that faith, Jesus Christ, is the one that's worthy for you to die by. That when you cross from this life into the next, that the faith of that that person, Jesus Christ, is going to be there to take you. Jesus talks a great deal about that when he left this earth, he went to heaven And he prepares a place for those who love him on his father's house that one day he's going to come back, the second coming, to take us to be with him. We've talked about that. I want to encourage you that if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way, don't leave here without that. Don't leave here without that. We were driving to Colorado Springs on Christmas Eve after the worship service here. The roads were great. We thought, oh, we missed all all the bad stuff. The roads are great. We're flying along. My wife's looking. She says, can I sit back and just rest a little bit? And I said, sure. Everything's going good. We've got a full moon. The roads are clear. We missed all the big heavy snow. It's easy sailing for the next six hours in my brother's house until six big elk run right out in front of us. And you guys know this, huh? You know this. Now, we're not in my truck, which has no chance at all. We're in my wife's minivan, which is going to get us killed. Okay, we're going to hit those elk, and they're going to laugh at us. I slam on the brakes. I swerve. I'm thinking we're done. Next thing I know, we're on the other side of the elk having a question in my mind about how is that possible? The faith that you live by better be the one that you're ready to die by because you don't know when that is. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, it is destined for man to die once and after that to face judgment. My question to you today is, Do you have one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus? Are you ready to hold?